J.T. Crowley is Talking Books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, everyone. I'm J.T. Crowley, and I have the great pleasure today of welcoming back Dr. Penny Claus from Dallas in Texas in the United States. And this is about her third book in the Time Keepers series, Royal Stain. Um, it's a book that I really do think that people who love dark fantasy and sci-fi followers, you're going to love this book because it just fits your genre, guys. It just fits everything about it. The, the, the figures that are in it, the characters in there, the storyline. So enjoy the third book, everybody. But if you haven't read the, the first two, you need to read the first two. Now, Dr. Penny is a veterinary surgeon by profession, but has been writing books for some time now. So if you go to her webpage, authorpclaws.com, there you'll find more about the book Dr. Penny Claus has written and how to get hold of them. But for the purpose of today's show, we're going to talk about her latest book, Royal Stain. Now, you might be sitting there, everybody, and you'll see, well, hang on here. There are two people um, sitting side by side. You're absolutely right. You're not getting double vision, so you don't have to go off to the opticians. Um, we have brought in on this podcast uh, Penny's daughter, Stephanie. And why have we done that? Well, I'll reveal that in a minute. But Penny, Stephanie, come and join me on the show. Hi, John. Good to see you again. It's always oh. a pleasure. <laughs> and for the first time, Stephanie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Very happy to be here. You're welcome. Now, the reason why everybody, Stephanie, is sitting next to Dr. Penny Claus is because when you look at the book club, uh, the book cover, well, Stephanie has designed the book cover. Talk to me, Stephanie, about the book cover. How did you put it all together? Because it's very... Um, you know, mystique, it's dark, it's sinister, and I think it really sums the book up. It's cleverly done. What's your version here? I wish I could say that it's something fantastical that, you know, I had thought about it for a long time and, you know, really looked for images, stuff like that. I didn't. It was very simple. Um, I knew a vision I had in my head of what I thought it should look like, and I had three covers in mind. Um, so I started out with this one, actually, and I just started with the black background. I'm like, okay, I need something to represent the time part of it. So I custom, I customized the font for the time stealers. And I started with that. And if you look at the title, you see the, the T, both T's on there. They are clock hands facing down. And I started with that. I'm like, okay, I need something else to represent this. So I started looking and I needed to get a, I was looking for a watch, a pocket watch, specifically a pocket watch, because I remembered that the pocket watches were the ones that carried the evil rates, correct? Mm. So I put that on there and I was like, it needs something else. And I had this vision in my head of a movie I saw many years ago unfortunately i can't remember which one but it was a pair of eyes staring at the person you know almost directly like it was looking into their soul and it had like that kind of fade into the background look and i'm like that's what i want so i just looked up an image of someone i of a uh an just an image of just a person Nothing in particular. I was just looking for a person. I think I put in angry eyes and it came up with this photo. And I was like, at the instant I saw it, I knew that was it. I had to use it. So I took it. I did a little Photoshop tinkering around and compiled it, played with some of the placement and sent it to her to see what she thought. Because my first impression of it when I saw it, I just thought powerful, sinister. Mm, it just got, just sets the scene for the story, dark and sinister. Yeah, so 
Well done, you. Do you go, mm -hmm. Are you going to be thinking now, oh, shall I do any, any covers for anybody else now? <laughs> uh, this is this um, a new venture for uh, Stephanie. <laughs> I'm always taking commissions. I don't really, um, it's not something I do full time. Uh, I do have a full time job, but it is something I like to do on the side. It's something that I like to do in my free time. And I mean, if I really click with something like I did with this particular cover, then it's very easy to do. And I find that's where I get a lot of inspiration is when I really click with something. Great. Um, Dr. Penny, it was August last year when we, you know, we did your first podcast. And of course, that's when we talked about the first two books in the series. Um, the Timekeeper's Chronicles, book one, and of course, Hope Eternal, book two. And I'm just thinking, you know, we're not quite a year on. Um, here we are with book three, The Royal Stain. Mm -hmm. How have you, in that short time, because yes, we've been chatting over the months, talking to each other about all sorts of things. How have you put this magical book of yours together in such a short time? Actually, it had been a little bit longer than that. Um, it was in the works when we talked last time. It wasn't completed yet. I was having a hard time getting it completed. Um, I had been working on it for before the pandemic hit. And, um, and I used the, uh, the regional uh, meetings, you know, for the NAWCC for inspiration. I'd be said we'd get a table, I'd have my books there, you know, to talk to people and so. And, you know, I would use that time, you know, to just soak in the atmosphere and see what was out there, the many different types of clocks. There was a music box exhibit um, that was part of the inspiration for this story. Um, of course, the pocket watches that we see, uh, there's so much there at those shows, you know, and they're just fascinating. So not having that, you know, because we didn't have those meetings, you know, during the pandemic, it was hard to pull it together. But I was able to finally get some traction going. And um, that's when I finalized the book uh, earlier this year. And, um, and then, you know, was just trying to figure out how I was going to get it out to the public. And that finally settled on where we are now. Yeah, I'm, I get that. Um, now you're a busy vet. So when do you decide to write, you know, are you one of these people, uh, Dr. Penny, that's, uh, you write first thing in the morning or you write late at night, or are you a bit like me? It's whenever the moment arises and you just sit down and open up the laptop and spill the, uh, what's going on, you know, behind the glasses. You know, yeah. what's going on in your head onto, right. the, uh, onto the computer. Yeah, it's, it's like, like you, just whenever it hits, sometimes I'm at work and the, the gears start going, you know, I start picking up threads and start, you know, and uh, I'm doing my job but in the background, you know, especially if I have a moment. Sometimes I'll make notes when I'm at work, you know, just so I don't lose that, you know, um, inspiration, you know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I have to, I can't just sit down at a laptop and not have somewhere to go, you know, or what to write because I'll just stare at it. And that's the most frustrating thing. Um, but if, if it starts to flow, then that's when I will, you know, I'll sit at the laptop and I'll either work on it for hours or it'll be just enough to get those ideas down that have been percolating. And then it'd be like, okay, I'm gonna have to let this sit a while and then revisit it. So you're not one of those authors that sets out, oh, I've got to do a thousand words a day. I can't do that. I can't I do mean, it either. Because, uh, you know, if I did that, it, it wouldn't be right. I mean, I, I have tried that technique and it was, I'd go back and read it. It's like, oh, this was so bad, you know, because it was forced, you know, yeah. and you can tell it's forced. Uh, it has to, it has to flow, you know. So yeah, it, it, that technique does not work for me. Because you have to enjoy writing it, don't you? Exactly. And if exactly. it becomes a chore, it doesn't, you know, yeah. it comes across. Yeah. It, it really does. Um, Penny, there are 40 chapters to this 
dark fantasy book of yours. Can you just remind everybody um, who Charlotte and Grant Stone are and how you went about creating these characters? Let's just go back a bit so that we can go forward with this new book. Grant and yeah. Charlotte. Grant and, Grant and Charlotte, um, when the inspiration for the story came, I needed a, a very uh, well, well um, rounded character already uh, that kind of knew what was going on, that that could instruct somebody else that that you know to, uh, into this world of time race and and. Um, and how they live in antique clocks and stuff like that. So um, I try to choose a very strong name and something simple, something easy to remember. And um, I didn't have any particular person in mind, you know, when the, the uh, character started to form. Um, he just kind of, in just writing it, he just kind of came out of, you know, um, uh, you know, sometimes characters kind of form themselves, it seems. They develop as they go along. Exactly. And that's mm. kind of how it was yeah. with him and Charlotte. And I needed him to be kind of have a, an ancient wisdom and knowledge, but yet look like he's in his middle age, you know. Yes. And I explained how that happens, you know, in the stories. And then Charlotte, she's, um, she's seeing these rights. She doesn't know what they are. Um, and she's always seen them all her life. And nobody ever was there to to help her with it, you know, um, to instruct her on what she was seeing. And she wasn't crazy until one night, she just had to run to somebody. And for whatever reason, she was attracted to Grant in his clock shop. She knew of him through her grandfather. Yeah. And so I have a, a younger kind of, you know, woman, you know, early 20s, who is just frantic and knowing she, she needs to know, is she crazy? or not. And so she's drawn to him. And of course, he's at first skeptical about what she wants, but then he's able to kind of walk her through what they mm. do. And the, the loosely associated group of keepers that are worldwide that can see and interact with the race. Because they are the timekeepers, aren't they? They are the timekeepers. They're the timekeepers, everybody. Um, you gave Charlotte and Grant now in this book, everybody, the third book, you gave Charlotte and Grant a child. Yes. Nicknamed LG, um, who comes into the storyline in chapter four. Why did you give LG these extrasensory powers? And you also gave him a very, very strong time wraith, a young time wraith, Chan. And that time wraith is a very significant time wraith in the book. Yes. yes. Talk to me about these characters. How do they come about? What and the storylines that you built them? Why? Talk to me about this. Well, I needed a newcomer into the story to advance the story i mean you have to have new elements coming into play to keep interest and to build the world up more and um and so of course grant and charlotte they're married now what's the most natural thing to happen you know is to have a child now they had no idea if their child was going to have any ability you know because grant of course we know he's been part of the keeper community which are all male What's different about Charlotte is she's the only woman that has emerged to have full keeper abilities. So would that pass on, you know, to their child? Well, as it comes about, yes, it does. And because of that, because he's one that is a child of two keepers, he does have more abilities than they, they could ever dream of. Um, even the race, you know, didn't understand all his abilities. And then with the, um, the newcomer, the Wraith, um, I don't want to spill too many beans about him, um, and their childhood friendship, 
you know, that doesn't come out until later, um, they make the dynamic duo, you know, of this story to, they have to be there to be able to um, win the end game. Yeah, I, I, I can see that, you know, this, it's, you've got two generations here. You've got, you know, Charlotte Grant, um, and then you've got the time rates that go with them, you know, Becca, um, mm -hmm. possibly the Oracle. And mm -hmm. then you've got now LG and his time rate, Cham. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we can see there's a new generation coming in here to this series. Um, I was intrigued, I have to say, and I don't know what you think about why your mom has put this character in, Stephanie. <laughs> Curtis. <laughs> Now, Curtis, for me, he's obviously, he's got, uh, he's, you, you put him in, 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 in an institution, yeah. uh, which is probably hinting at that he's got mental health, you know, issues. Why Curtis? Why is he such a powerful character? Almost like, you know, he's an evil character, isn't he? He's yes. up to no good. Yes. Tell us yeah. more here. Yeah, it's funny because I had a, a book review done, you know, of the, the Timekeeper uh, uh, series. And um, the book reviewer, she, she um, likened the whole series, you know, to because she read the third book too, to give the review to the MCU. And she likened Curtis to Loki. And uh, because his, his mischievousness and stuff like that. And I, it, that just made me laugh. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. But <clears throat> we needed a, um, an, uh, an antagonist. And what is about Curtis is he's the brother to Charlotte. And he's the one that, and, and he's a very, he's an individual who needs to be powerful, who needs to be known, who needs to, to be significant, okay? He just, he doesn't feel like he's significant unless he is like, um, has a power over somebody, you know? And he's also very um, gullible um, because uh, he gets taken in by the evil keeper um, who feeds into this, um, his, his, his personality of needing to be in power. Um, and to be noticed, you know, because he wants to be known. Everybody wants to be noticed, but like the, he, he needs to be the everybody's center of attention. You know, that kind of rounds out his character. So he's because of this, he's just a constant problem, you know, throughout the whole series because of his getting involved, you know, because of his uh, um, his bent toward wanting to be bad and is bent to be you know, kind of uh, gullible toward people praising him and, you know, kind of uh, um, trying to help uh, his ego, like keep stroking his ego. Now, you set the scene of this book um, in lockdown. Yes. This book, everybody's written during lockdown. And lockdown is mentioned in COVID-19 because they are locked in the uh, three-story uh, block the apartment that they've got you know with the basement with the the royal stain the royal um rates down there then you've got the shop and then you've got the uh the living quarters above and of course they're locked in due to covid mm -hmm. did you do this deliberately so that you could concentrate more on the storyline of the characters to get the dark sinister side out of this book and so therefore you weren't spending time describing scenery outside the you know the clock shop was it done deliberately yes it, it in, in a, a large part of it done deliberately but also is the influence of uh, actually going through the pandemic you know and although i didn't I didn't um, name it, you know, the COVID pandemic. I left it open that um, so that if people like years from now read it, 
you know, they could get a little flavor of what was going on, you know, mm. during this time. Um, and it was, I mean, because near the start of the book, we weren't quite to the pandemic yet, but the majority of it is there because I needed LG to grow up. I needed him to go, come from a baby into a place to where he was, um, he got, he, he, his ability were more known and he could actually do something. Babies wouldn't be able to do what he needed to do, you know? So I had to kind of mark time. That's why it's kind of a slow burn, you know, on what's going on. There's hints, there's, you know, different things that come out, stuff like that. And using the pandemic and having them in one location, you know, lended itself to that. I thought you did. That's why I was going, that's why I've asked. Mm -hmm. And then because you take LG and Cham up into the attic, we're not going yes. there. Read the book, everybody. <laughs> not going to give that one away. Now, um, we've got to talk about the clocks and their mechanical movements because this the, is the mechanical movements that the time rates that live in these clocks feed on. Yes. Now, time rates, and you know, when you talk about in your book here, Dr. Penny, yeah, they can if they choose to feed off humans. Yes. But they intend to get most of their source uh, from the mechanical movement in the clock. Yes, the good way, good race. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so these, the time, you know, these mechanical clocks, they're an important part to the, the storyline. Yes. Can you tell us about clocks they're important to you and mm -hmm. stephanie they're important to you as well aren't they it runs yes. in the family yes <laughs> and because you're all involved because you no know, dave your husband is the you know the clock person this is why the clocks are in the books she works on them too <laughs> yeah <laughs> Spill the beans here, you two. Talk yeah. to us about the clocks and why you know you put certain rates in certain clocks. Well, I thought about having like a hierarchy within the the race, you know, society. Some that were more prone to live in the wooden case clocks, the larger clocks, you know, something like that. Then I thought, well, that might be a little bit too intricate, you know, in the society. I mean, we have the sentinels that live in the tower clocks because that's a more powerful, you know, uh, a movement to support them. Um, <clears throat> and then we've got the street clocks, you know, where, you know, we have the Oracle. And those are specific um, type of clocks. But a lot of times when I, I uh, show the clocks or introduce the clocks, it's also to make people more aware of the variety of timepieces that are out there. And I've had feedback from people that are, uh, in fact, um, uh, somebody I know from my childhood who is from England. She uh, was uh, born and raised in London. I had her help me with book two uh, in the London scenes and stuff. And she said she goes back to uh, London every year. And uh, she said when she went, after she read my story, and she went back, she goes, you know, I notice them more now. You know, I certainly the, notice them now. Current thoughts. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I know you keep sending me pictures. Those are awesome, by the way. Um, and uh, and so that is my, actually, if you want some reason for these books, the kind of behind the scenes is to make people more aware of the antique clocks, their variety, their, their timelessness, kind of a, you know, uh, anyway, but they're, they've been around, some of these have been around way longer than the make and they still work if they're kept properly you know believe me i've seen some very old clocks resurrect so and that was and then just this idea that came to me one time you know in the show you know in um, the regional meeting in houston i just tied that sci-fi element into introducing clocks and mm -hmm. um and people seem to be enjoying them it's fascinating you know because the time rates they live in the clocks that's yes. their homes and yes. particularly with the the, the oracle one you know, there's a street clock you know uh -huh. and the timekeepers are thinking oh wonder if the oracle would like to move into the you know 
Right. <laughs> the new clock they've got. <clears throat> uh -huh. So they are an important part, but what I want to do now is, there's another fascinating character here. And why am I going to talk about Winston? Because Winston, the butler, he is controlled, isn't he? He, you know, he got one of these pocket watches and there was something in it. I'm not saying what everything, mm -hmm. but the royal king has controlled Winston. Yes. Poor Winston. Why did he have to control Winston? Tell us. Without giving uh, too much away. I know. I, I'll try not to give too many spoilers. Um, I needed somebody close to, to Charlotte and Grant um, to be at the um, under control of the king. And believe me, he is he he fights. He tries to fight that control. Um, but the mental powers of the king are just way too much, you know. Um, but uh, um, quite frankly, all along in the series, I kept wanting to, you know, you always hear the butler did it, you know. Um, and I, I always had this, maybe I should make him kind of like a Curtis character, but I couldn't. Winston was too nice. He was too loyal. He was too, so for him to do bad things, he would have had to be controlled by, you know, some sort of evil force, you know, for him to, and then show that he's trying to keep his loyalty as much as possible, you know, showing his strength of character. So, um, and then, you yeah. know, but he's, you know, so let's yeah, that's do, kind let, of- Let's get on to the time rates. Okay. You know, we've got the good time rates. Um, uh, we've got Becca, we've got the Oracle. Um, Cham? Mm -hmm. um, now these are mystical um, creatures and they've come from another homeland and they're on earth because of what the royal race, the ruling race family who created the great evil, which has yes. put the time race on to earth, not their original right. homelands. Exactly. Talk to me about the time rates the good ones, and then we'll move on to the royal ones. Okay. Um, the good time rates, they realized early on when they came to Earth that because <clears throat> where their homeland was, um, they were fed by a pulsar, a rhythmic pulsing type of, of uh, um, mechanism. So they were attracted to Earth because of the heartbeats. Um, and so when they, uh, they found when they tried to take, get sustenance from humans, they saw, the good race saw how it affected humans and they were, they tried to stay away from humans. That's where they were attracted to the man, mechanical clocks because the mechanical clocks were starting to come to be developed about the time they came to earth. Um, and so that's where they started living in the mechanical clocks. Now the, the bad race didn't care, you know, so, but the good race, they did that and they found that there's certain people that they could only perceive that they could interact with on basic levels and, um, and try to encourage them, especially during modern times to keep the mechanical clocks going. So they had homes. Now the, um, the royal race, they yes. are the ruling family of the time race. Right. Why was it so important um, for them to be incarcerated, you know, especially the king? Um, he does escape. Um, so they are they're downstairs in the basement. Why is it so important to have them incarcerated? When they came to Earth and when they emerged uh, from uh, where they were trying to, they, they, a lot of them died on their way here because they were in space too long without any sustenance. And when they finally came to Earth and they, they got, uh, survived long enough for them to be recognized who this last group of race showed up, um, Becker especially noticed that she picked up that they were going to have problems with them because they wanted to, they wanted to it reinstilled the rule of you know over the race. 
And the race had been on earth for a while and had developed their own way of living. They did not want to be back under the royal rule. And when she saw that they couldn't accept it and, and saw that the great evil that had come with them had stained them, then, um, then that's why they were incarcerated uh, until they could figure out what could they do with them, you know, um, to either try to help them see that, you know, they could be part of their community, but they can't rule. And if there's a way that they could get them to change enough, you know, redemption type thing. <clears throat> but in the meantime, while they're trying to figure all that out, they had them incarcerated. I wonder. Hmm. I mean, <laughs> Stephanie, what do you think to your mom's in book? I really enjoy it. Uh, growing up with, you know, just in the fantasy type things, always being drawn to fantasy, dark fantasy especially, you know, I think it's a new take on something that I don't think I've ever seen done in a novel before. So it's, it's very new, it's fresh, it's different. I mean, nowadays you see a lot of copy paste, copy paste when it comes to storylines and you know, characters and stuff like that. So I think this will, this story brings something fresh to the table, something different, something that will make people think and notice that, you know, these plots that are probably sitting, have been sitting on the mantle for only God knows how long that it, you're like, oh, I wonder if there's something in there. Kind of like Toy Story. When I was a kid, you know, I would look at yeah. that and I think, huh, I wonder if my toys are doing something when I'm not looking. <laughs> You know, I, I looked at the, I look at these clocks, you know, and I'm thinking, ooh, is there anything mm, in there? Yeah. <laughs> is, is there a good wraith in there? Is there a spooky what's yeah. in that clock? You know, going, oh, even a pocket watch, you're thinking, you've got me thinking, <laughs> what's in there? <laughs> I, I get that reaction a lot. I really do. You know, people who have read it, you know, they'll, they'll come by my table, like at the shows and stuff. And they'll be like, you know, they'll start talking about, you know, their, their clocks and wondering if there's somebody in there, you know, so that's mm. cool. I, like I that. mean, is the ending of this book, um, Dr. Penny, is this a defining moment? Is this the last one? Or do you think there is, you've left enough threads um, and a slither of a window opening for some of the characters to come back in the future. Um, you know, a narrow option is open for maybe another book. Come on, spill the beans. We won't tell anybody, honestly, everybody. We won't say that it's just between me and Dr. Penny and Stephanie. Uh, <laughs> um, I will say yes. I do have, I know of threads I've left. Um, there's a skeleton of a possible book, but it's not going to be anytime soon. Um, I'm going to kind of let this one percolate in, in the uh, book readers, you know, community and clock community. Um, and, uh, and we'll see. But um, it's not like a, the, after I wrote two, I was telling people, okay, there's going to be a third. There has to be a third. You know, and they knew that was going to be like coming as soon as I could get it out. This one, we'll see. You know, it's going to be percolating. It's going to be, and then at some point, I know, because this has happened before, the story is going to come out, and then I will be at my laptop typing away. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Penny Stephanie, who do you see the market for your books? Um, and who would you like to see reading them? Um, Clock people really like them. Uh, that's been my main fan base right now because they recognize the clocks in them. They enjoy the, the ones that like sci-fi, you know, they enjoy the thought of, you know, somebody living in their clocks, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and I have had people who have bought them for younger members of their family because they're family friendly. And so they bought them for their grandkids or their nieces, their nephews and stuff like that. So to try to, you know, uh, I, I guess a way to get them interested in the, the clock world, as well as make it fun and have a, 
a mystique about it, you know, um, that sort of thing. Well, I think that's, what, that's important too, because, yeah. you know, even now there's not a whole lot of people that are repairing clocks. That's why I started to get into it is because I saw that there was this art that was dying, literally. And it's sad because these clocks contain so much history and they're passed down a lot of the time from family to family. So, you know, it's, you looking at them, it's like, what have you seen? You know, what have you been through? And I think being able to get it out to the younger people that will help it live on and probably bring more awareness to this art. So I, I think that's good that, you know, the people are buying it for the, their kids and everything, because that's, that's important. Perhaps the, kids will think... go around, perhaps the kids will go around saying, hello, anybody in there? <laughs> <laughs> Probably I so. Yeah. I can see that. But it'll be, it, I'm wrong. <laughs> it'd be oh, very I'm spooky sorry. if the clock replied, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I thought about putting the clock up at my little table, you know, with my books and try to have some, if I could do like a 3D image of a race, kind of moving around in the clock, you know, <laughs> that would be so cool. <laughs> that can be yeah. done. <clears throat> um, Dr. Penny, where can people get your books? Um. Most uh, major retailers, uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, any platform, you know, where you can get books, um, that it should be available, you know, on there. Your web page? My web page is broken right now. <laughs> I need to get it fixed. I'm not able to get access to it to, to put it on there, you know, and with the links and everything. Um, I'm going to have to uh, get some help in revamping it. Um, but I'm hoping to do that soon. So but there's that potential to put be. it on there. Yes, yeah. there will be. Yeah, that, yeah. I just don't know when. <laughs> yeah, no ETA. So, Dr. Penny, I would just like to say it's been a huge pleasure, pleasure knowing you over the past year, chatting to you about your books and all sorts of things. Um, I'm meeting with you, Stephanie, for the first time, and that might see more um, illustrations from other authors. You might get some more commissions. You never know. <laughs> and um, mum, want, mum might want a cut of the commission. You two can <laughs> round about that. Ah, uh, nah. Nah. <laughs> and of course, um, you know, we've got to mention that, you know, your husband, David, has been a tremendous support for you throughout all your writings. Oh, definitely. And, and even though Joshua, you know, your son isn't a clockwork fan at the moment, you're still working on it. You know, he's still a vital part of the family, isn't he? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Definitely. Yes. And even to your boss at, I'm going to give your boss a nod here <laughs> at, at, the, uh, at the veterinary place. Uh, Kevin, give her plenty of options, you know, hours to, uh, to write these wonderful books. Kevin, sure left. Give her the time to write sure. the books, yes. She might be doing, treating the dogs or the cats or something like that, and she might have the other hand on the laptop writing. <laughs> <laughs> He's been very supportive too. Yeah. 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 Anyway, Dr. Penny Claus, thank you for coming back to talk about your amazing book, The, the Royal Stain, you know, the third book in the series of the Timekeepers series. Well, what can I say? Let's see if we've sown the seed, everyone, for another book, book number four. Let's see if I can work on her, everybody. But <laughs> Will the time race, the royals be back? Will Cham be back? What's going to happen to LG? Let's just watch this space. <laughs> Dr. Penny, Stephanie, thank you very much. Thank I'm JT Crowley. Me. Thanks for listening, watching wherever you are in the world. So until next time, stay safe. Thank you.